All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the GOCC. Um, today, we're very happy to have Florence Moss Garapi from UCAM. Um, and before we get to her talk, let's uh, go over the community statement quickly. So um, our community statement for the seminar has sort of three core ideas. One is that we're all learning. Uh, two is that everyone has something to contribute. And three is that no one has all the answers. Um, so try to keep that in mind as this talk goes forward. Um, and today, Florence is going to be talking about understanding the plethysms of squares of homogeneous and elementary functions using product of Tableau. Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, so just uh, I want to say that this work is uh, joint work with Etienne Tetro, also from UCAM. So uh, he's here. So if ever you have questions, please, please feel free to uh, ask them in the chat and he'll try and answer them as much as possible. And uh, it's the work done under the supervision of Franco Saliala, who's also here. Uh, so maybe Franco, if you see a question passing, you can also answer them. Um, this is work that uh, is uh, in our article, which is uh, supposed to be appearing on archive tomorrow. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, learning a bit more, uh, please, you're welcome to have a look at it. Um, so maybe just a bit of an overview of what we're going to do. So uh, in uh, our article, we talk about homogeneous and elementary symmetric functions, but here I'm going to focus really on uh, homogeneous symmetric functions, uh, just because otherwise there's not enough time. So what we're going to try and do is look at the square of a homogeneous symmetric function, uh, decompose it in the basis of sure functions, and we're going to look at um, the coefficients here appearing. And what we want to do is, um, well, we have that the, any square of any symmetric symmetric function decomposes into platisms, which we usually call uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. And so what we're going to be interested in doing is looking at to um, with each copy, whether if they go into the symmetric or anti-symmetric part. And so what we're going to do is um, define combinatorial objects that are counted by those, um, those coefficients. Here we have cost and numbers, so they're going to be tableaus of a certain shape and filling. We're going to define a statistic on those tableaus, and this statistic will, will tell us if we land uh, into one or the other of the platisms. So the general um, idea of the talk is we're going to, well, define uh, everything that uh, we need to do this. Um, we're going to understand what happens when we calculate the square of a homogeneous symmetric function using the Piri rule. And uh, we're going to see that uh, we can also interpret, so those coefficients we find in the squares using RSK. And the definition I'm going to use for RSK is actually uh, a bit unconventional. I'm going to define it in terms of product of tableau. So even if you've heard of RSK before, uh, hopefully you can learn something through this talk a bit. Um, and we're going to see that um, with this description, we're, we're able to define a sign statistic. Uh, I hope that by the time I define the sign statistic, you have a bit of an insight of why it works. Um, I'm going to state our results, um, have a few examples. I'm going to explain to you the idea of the proof and um, tell you a bit more of what we hope to do next. So the main tools that I'll be using are really combinatorial tools. So I'll introduce the RSK um, algorithm based on a product of tableaus, which um, have been described really thoroughly by Fulton, but kind of follow through from results of Lascaux and Schutzenberger. And in the proofs kind of hidden in, in some results that uh, I will just state here, uh, we use some basic properties of platism and transformation transition matrices between basis of symmetric functions. So it's uh, really relatively basic uh, notions that we're using and we're putting them together to get our results. 
Um, so some motivation of why we're interested in to looking at platism. So, well, polynomial representations of GLN, um, they have a character which is symmetric functions. And the representations we're interested in breaking them into irreducible representations and those irreducible representations, they have a character which is sure functions. So when we try and break down a symmetric function into sure functions, this is exactly what uh, we're doing uh, in the other in the representation theory world. Um, and the representations, if they have the proper characteristics, we can compose them. And so in terms of asymmetric functions, this translates into uh, the operation of platism. And so I'm not going to use so much of uh, platism in this talk. There's only about two facts that you need to know. Uh, the first thing is that for symmetric functions, um, the, what it looks like is kind of a, well, essentially a composition. So we will take the monomials of G and kind of plug them into the variables of F. So we do kind of a change of var variables. So that's all that we need to, um, to know uh, for the basic definition. And we will use the fact that, as I said before, the square of any symmetric function splits up into two platisms, the symmetric part and anti-symmetric part. So the S2 and S11 here are uh, sure functions. There's so, a short question in the chat, yeah, of course. which is, could you quickly recall the definition of a polynomial representation? Yeah, of course. So the a polynomial representation, so representations, we usually, um, we can see them as matrices and you can see it that um, it sends one matrix onto another matrix and all entries will be polynomials in the entries of the first matrix or into the the, rather into the um, Egan values of the matrix, the first matrix. So what we get inside the second matrix is our polynomials. That's what we want to have. Does that answer the Thank question? You. All right, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, be they, they say, to, oh, thanks. Uh, so. All right, so be free to ask questions while I'm talking, please. Um, you can even just turn on your mic and ask the question. Um, so, uh, to define sure functions, uh, well, we need tableaus because I'm going to use the combinatorial definition of sure functions. Uh, so tableaus are defined uh, first off on, uh, on with their shapes. So the shapes will be uh, based on partitions. So a partition lambda uh, is a, a vector of integers where e the integers uh, weakly decrease. Um, and we say we have a partition of n if um, we um, have that all parts uh, sum to n. So when we have a tableau, we're going to allow to have skew shapes. So the skew shape, the idea is that um, we have the outside shape, which is a partition. So the partition, we see it that the first part of the partition is the number of boxes in the first row the number of boxes in the second row is the, num the second uh, integer in our partition, et cetera. And uh, we allow for, uh, to have an inner shape here. Um, and this is going to be the minus three one. So we have three boxes, one boxes at the bottom. So now that we have a shape, we wanna fill it. We fill it with integers um, such that the rows weekly increase and columns strictly increase. So uh, to, um, to record the filling, uh, we're going to consider the content of the tableau. So the content of the tableau is essentially another integer vector where uh, we count the number of entries one, of entries two, of entries three, et cetera, in our tableau. So for example, here we have one, 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 one. So we have four ones. Then how many twos? One, two, three, four, five, six, six twos. We have one, two, three, four, five, threes. And finally, we have only one four. So we can also see it as kind of a infinite vector because we can just say that, well, we have zeros 
afterwards and we have just uh, no none of these entries and so using this content statistic um, we're able to define a certain monomial that will be associated to our tableau this is uh, the way that we're going to define our shear functions and so the monomial is going to be well we take a certain uh, we take variable x1 to be to the power of the number of ones in our tableau so it would be four here x2 would be uh, with the power of number of two so six x3 so we keep going x3 would be to the five x4 would be to the one and all the other ones are of the exponent have exponent zero so they kind of disappear so sure functions they're going to be defined uh, for a certain uh, partition we can also define them for skew partitions and they're going to be uh, expressed as the sum over all possible tableaus all possible fillings of this shape and we can we uh, give all the we consider all the monomials with the as we constructed them here um so this is the combinatorial definition of sure functions there's so many other definitions of sure functions uh, maybe you know some of them but this is the one i'm going to use in this presentation um, there's some particular uh, tableaus which are going to be of interest for us here, and they are the line tableaus, so just an array of boxes of length n. So these we're going to be using to define um, homogeneous uh, symmetric functions, and we're going to do this in the following way. So we're going to define uh, lambda tuples of line tableaus to be essentially a vector where each element in the vector is a tableau and the length of those line tableaus are uh, defined by the partition lambda that we have. So here would be our, my partition lambda. Uh, lambda one is five, so I have a tableau of length five, uh, a line tableau of length five. Lambda two is five also, so I have a line tableau of length five, et cetera. So I can use any filling inside of each my tableau um, of my line tableaus uh, of course my only condition is i weakly increase because i want to have a semi-standard young tableaus um, um yeah so this is essentially the same condition as semi-standard young tableau it's just we're no longer requiring it to be decreasing in the columns right well since we're going to only consider line tableaus uh, so we don't have multiple um, we don't have multiple lines one on top of the other, so we don't need that condition. I guess I meant for a lambda tuple, like lambda is just a normal parti uh, partition, right? And lambda so is a normal partition, yeah. I I could take these and if I restack them on top of each other. If you restack them on top of each other, you'd get tabloids. Okay. So this is essentially an an other way of talking about um, tabloids, which is actually going to give us some extra insight uh, in this way. Okay. So as maybe you know the definition of homogeneous symmetric functions on uh, question. Sum over tabloids. I let just let me finish that. Sorry. Um, the we just have exactly the same definition where we sum over all possible um, tuples of line tableaus of shape lambda. Yes, what for your question, please. Yes, uh, what is the restriction on the filling? Like the, the restriction on the filling is that for so, each tableau, we, uh, we weekly increase from left. Uh, we don't have to start with one, right? I'm sorry? Is, uh, do we have to start with one? No, right? No, we could have a two here, for example. Okay. Yeah. Of and up, up to any number we want. Yeah, exactly. So we, okay, cool. it, uh, we don't have a, a condition between the two tableaus. Uh, this is really the the idea of a tabloid we don't have relation between the 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 columns we really have that each row is on its own a line tableau and has the weekly increasing condition we don't care about the relations between the tableaus okay is that much clear? 
I'll take that. Yes, you. thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, so the general definition of homogeneous symmetric function, which uh, maybe you're a bit more familiar with, is, is this one. So that we have that h lambda is equal to the product of those h lambda 1, h lambda 2, et cetera, where h n is the sure function uh, s n, which is the summing, summing over um, so line, all possible line tableaus. And um, if you think about it just a bit, with what we get here is uh, essentially this is exactly the same as what we would get here, because in each uh, H lambda I would be picking a tableau, any um, of length lambda I, and we would be considering so any filling of this one tableau, and we'd be picking one tableau like this for each lambda I. And so this is essentially what we get. So instead of doing uh, when, when we consider the, this here, this would be the product of a, a, x to the t1 for the first, x to the t2 for the second, et cetera, to all the way to x to the tl. And each of these would be picked in one of those. So we get the same thing. Um, so now that we've defined our um, the, the uh, symmetric functions that we're going to be work, working with, um, I want to talk a bit more about uh, the square of H n. And so H n is this simpler uh, homogeneous fun uh, symmetric function. So we want to start with this. Uh, so we have that the Peary rule describes exactly how we uh, multiply by H n if we started off with any sure function. So the idea is um, we add, we start off with a uh, shape lambda and we add boxes such that no two lie in the same column and the shape that we get is still a partition. So we look at all the possibilities to get a partition starting with lambda and adding n boxes. And we, we just sum over all possible partitions we would get in this way. Um, so an example for um, hn square, we start here with h5 to the square. So we start with the partition, which is just a, a line of five boxes. And we consider all the different ways to add five other boxes in a horizontal band. So we can either put all of them still in the first row, one in the, um, in the second, two in the second, three in the second, four in the second, and up to five in the second. So this is, uh, so we have all the sure functions which are uh, associated just above the, the shape. And so we have that in general, h n square is going to be a sum over all possible sure functions of at most two parts, where uh, we essentially uh, change the number of boxes in the second row. So we start with none and we go all the way to, to n boxes. And um, an interesting result, which uh, we, you can find the, the proof of in our article, it's been known for quite a while. It's a result from um, Little Wood. Uh, actually, and it's that those sure functions, they will land into the symmetric part of the square if this i here is even, and it will land into the anti-symmetric part if this i is odd. And so if we look at the example we had previously, um, so the symmetric part, so we look at all the ones with second part, which is even. So we have this sure function, we have this sure function, and we have this one. And then if we look at the ones which would land into the anti-symmetric part, well, we have all the other ones that will have uh, uneven second part. So this is this result is really central to what uh, to the proofs that we're going to have. Um, so uh, you can remember this one. Uh, it's going to be very useful. So that's for the easy case. 
Now, what happens when we look at the square of h lambda? So h lambda square, well, we said that h lambda is h lambda one all the way to h lambda l. When we square it, we get this um, expression. And we have that here, we have so h lambda one, h lambda one, h lambda two, h lambda two, et cetera. And we can actually rewrite this as an another uh, homogeneous symmetric function where uh, the partition that indexes it is the one where we repeat each part twice. So now we can use the theory rule, which we have seen beforehand, um, to kind of better understand these coefficients. Because what we're doing is that we're kind of building a tableau because we're starting off with a first horizontal band. Then we're adding a second horizontal band, which has the same length. Then we're adding another one, which would have different length, lambda two. Then we'd be adding another one yet, which would also have, oops, which would also have length lambda two. And so we would keep going. And this way, when we, uh, we just fill all the boxes in the first um, horizontal band with ones, the, all the ones in the second horizontal band with twos, all the ones in the third horizontal band with threes, and et cetera, then what we're doing is we're building a semi-standard Young tableau. And so this Young tableau will have a certain shape and it will have filling lambda square. And so this is a way of understanding these coefficients using the theory rule. And so, as I said before, what we're interested to do is take those tableaus we get here and define a statistic that will tell us where we land. And so in order to do this, we're going to look at another interpretation of those tableaus in terms of RSK. And so we're going to see that those tableaus are going to be uh, recording tableaus. And so in order to do this, we need to go from the uh, lambda square tuples, which appear here and kind of translate them into uh, first uh, bywords, because if you know of RSK, we need, we need to have this, uh, to, we need to apply RSK on bywords. So this uh, first bijection is rather simple. Um, the idea is that uh, for all entries in T1, we're going to assign a top uh, letter, which is one, and we're going to just rewrite the entries of our tableau. Then we do the same for T2. Um, so we, we rewrite the uh, entries of our tableau with the top letters being twos. Then we do the same with T3 uh, with T and same thing again with T4. And uh, for those of you who know uh, the actual definition of bywords, we wanna have that um, we have two words uh, with uh, integers as letters, and we want to have that the top one is weakly increasing, which it is, and we want to have that for equal top entries, the uh, bottom letters are weakly increasing. So we do have a byword, which is what we want, because now we can apply RSK, and what RSK does is that it gives us a bijection between bywords and pairs of tableaus of the same shape, and the content of the first tableau will be exactly the same as that of uh, our lambda tuple. And the content of our tableau Q will be lambda. And so if we started off here with a lambda square tuple, then we land here with a lambda square tableau of a certain shape nu. And so what's going to happen is that the tableau Q here will be counted by those Kafka numbers and the um, monomials X to the P will be actually equal to X to the T. So when we started off 
with a tableau, um, a lambda squared tuple of tableau t here. So um, if you're not familiar with RSK, don't worry, I'm going to introduce it straight away. Maybe just to show you here, I did start with a lambda squared tuple of line tableaus in my example. What I get is a tableau here, which has the same filling. And this one we can see we have a horizontal band, so of length five for the ones, of length five for the twos, of length um, three for threes, and length three for the fours. So this is exactly the length of my uh, lambda, which was five, five, three, three, which was already a lambda square tuple. So if I could write it here, it's like a mu square for mu being five, three. So um, in order to define RSK, as I said, I'm going to define it on product of tableaus. And so product of tableaus, it really follows from results of Lascaux and Chutan-Berger on uh, the plactic monoid. The main idea of plactic monoid is that we have um, tableaus which can be seen as the representant of classes in this monoid. We, uh, plactic monoids defined on words. For words, we can just concatenate the words for a product and we wanna define a product of tableaus in the setting. And Fulton really did a great job of um, formalizing this uh, in his book on young tableaus. And so the idea is we built a skew tableau, which is the star product of the two by just putting them diagonally one from another. And then what we do is we use Jeux de Taquin to rectify this shape. And so uh, let's see this on this example. So we start off with these two tableaus here. So we take, uh, so let's just copy this, going to be quicker. Um, so we look at the inner shape here. If you're not familiar with Jeu de Taquin, this is how it works. Uh, and we consider an inner corner. Uh, this is an inner corner because it has uh, neighbors to the right and be below it, which are uh, non-empty. Uh, and so we want to move the entries around such that um, we keep the conditions on rows and columns. So here would be moving the two up. So I move the two up. Then again, I look at the inner shape, which I have. So my inner shape is this one. I have two inner corners. Now the important part with Jeux de Taquin is that no matter what order you pick for the slides, you will get the same rectification. So that's really important as well. Um, so here we'd be moving the one and the two. And we can also look at what would happen if we worked here, we'd move the two up over and the three. Then here, this uh, empty box lies on the outer corner and here as well. So we can see uh, we move so the one over and the two up. And here we move this two over and the three as well. So now what we have, we have still the same thing. Um, so we look at our inner shape. We have it like this. We have two inner corners. We move the one over then this two because otherwise we'd have a two over a two. It lays on the empty box lays on the outer corner. Now we go like this, we move the one over, then the two. We're all set for this one. So we move the one over, then the two. Here we move the one and the two up. And finally, we have only one step left, which is the following. So we again, look at inner corner. We have only one corner and we will be moving the one over, then the two. And finally, the tree so that 
the empty box lies on the outer corner, which gives us the following tableau. And so the idea is that um, the, when we consider the concatenation of the word of each of the two tableaus, which is, well, when we read this Q tableau like this, um, jeu de taquin kind of corresponds to Knuth equivalence. So if you're familiar with this, we get that uh, the, all through this, we get um, Knuth equivalent reading words. And so the, the concatenation of both reading words lie in the class, in the plactic monoid indexed by this tableau. So this is why it's all very linked to the plactic monoid. And so to describe RSK in terms of product of tableaus, um, we want to take a um, byword and project it onto a pair of tableaus of the same shape. So just like the traditional description, um, so we want to take the bottom word and take it onto the P tableau and the top word we're going to take onto into the Q tableau. So all letters in the bottom word will appear in the tableau P. All letters in the top, tab, top word will appear in the tableau Q. So just as the basic uh, traditional definition of RSK, we start by inserting V1 into just the empty shape. And so we take one box, put it, put the entry V1 inside, which gives us our first uh, insertion tableau. And Q, we want to have that it's the same shape. So we just create one box with entry U1. Then after a certain number of insertion steps, uh, what we do, this is where this differs from the traditional definition. Um, we take the previously calculated P1, PI, and we do the star product which, with the next letter. We rectify, this gives us our insertion tableau. It will have an extra box somewhere than in the previous one. And we add a cell in this position with entry U, uh, I plus one. So let's see an example because that's not necessarily easy to see how it works. So let's say we have this, uh, this byword. Um, we have all the letters here we want to insert. How I like to see it is that I can put all letters into an empty diagonal. And I want to start off with box, the first box here, which gives me the first box here. And I want to now um, rectify it with the next box over. So I will have one, two which gives me that I add this cell. Now I rectify both together with the next one, which will give me this shape. And I keep going like this, I'm always looking at, well, for this one, I am adding a one in my Q tableau. For the next one, I'm also adding a one in the Q tableau and et cetera. So I would just keep going. So this is a rather long process if you're doing it like this. In the case of a byword associated with a lambda square tuple, I can actually really speed up the process. So I'm going to explain this process um, in a more lengthy example here uh, where we can really see what's happening. So what we're going to do, which differs from my, my definition, is that I'm going to first straighten all the tableaus. Um, so I will really get back the tableaus which I had um, in my byword. And so why can we do this in this process? Well, all the tableaus, all the entries here correspond to entries one that will have to be put in my tableau queue. And all the second tableau correspond to entries that will be put in my tableau Q, which are twos. And this is because really the way we constructed our byword. Um, so here, what we do now, uh, now that we've rectified each of these tableaus, well, I start off with the horizontal band, which corresponds to my tableau T1. Then 
I do the star product of T1 and T2. Um, doing this, I can rectify this using Jeu de Taquin slides, which gives me this shape. Now I look at what I had before, which was this shape. What are the squares I added where I've added boxes three in the second row and two in the first row. So these are going to be the boxes where I put twos. Now I do the same thing with the third tableau. So I take this tableau and put do the star product with the next tableau. So tableau T3. I rectify this with Jeu de Taquin slides and this gives me this shape. Now I look at what's the shape I had before, which is this one. And I look at what are the cells I've added. So I've added two in the third row and one in the second, which are exactly the, where I will have to put my trees. And then finally, I do the last step, which is do the star product of the tableau I've, I've gotten and of the fourth tableau. And I'm going to rectify all of this with Jeu de Taquin slides. And I'm getting my last shape, which will be my tableau P. I'm having, I want to keep the same shape. So again, I look at uh, the shape I had before. So I've added those, oops, those cells. And these cells are exactly where I'm going to have the force in my tableau Q. So the reason why I'm having the same tableau P is just because whichever order in which I do the rectification, it's all going to work uh, because that's the property of Jeu de Taquin. It has a confluence. Uh, we can use any order of rectifying. Um, is there any question up till now? All right. Um, so, now that we've seen kind of the way to get our Tableau Q, um, I'm going to give you again, another way of rectifying this. Um, and maybe the, my hope is that it will give you an insight on why we will, def on why we define our sign statistic in the way that we will. So I wanna take this Tableau Q and eventually give it a um, sign statistic. So to do this, I'm going to first consider an extra rectification process, which is where, well, I first start by rectifying each tableau to, on its own. And instead of rectifying together first, the star product of T1 and T2, then the star product of the tableau I get with T3, and then finally with T4, well, I'm just going to rectify T1 and T2 together, and T3 and T4 together. And if I had more, I would just pair them two by two. And so what I get is a tableau, which will have at most two lines. And what's important to see is that, well, here I had tableaus of length five. And so this tableau is actually something that will appear in H5 squared. And here I had three, three line tableaus. So here is a tableau that would appear in H3 squared. Oops, H3 squared. And so if you recall well, um, we said that, well, the number of boxes in the second row of this shape actually tells us if this shape and the, the sure function associated to this shape lands into the symmetric or anti-symmetric part. And so here we have one box, which means that the sure function associated to this shape would land into the anti-symmetric part of the square of H3. And this one also has three boxes in the bottom row. So it would also land into the anti-symmetric part, but this time of the square H5. And so with this, I hope that you will understand better why we define our, our sign statistic in the following way. And so when we take our tableau Q, we're going to consider 
sub tableaus of Q with entries uh, 2i minus 1 and 2i. So for example, we'd have the sub tableau with entries 1 and 2, the sub tableau with entries 3 and 4, the sub, sub tableau with entries 5 and 6, et cetera. And so they're going to be skew tableaus, and we will rectify them into a certain tableau QI. These tableaus will recover exactly the, the shapes that we had here before. They will have at most two lines. And as I said, the number, the, the number of boxes in the second line, which is the GI here, tell us if we land into the symmetric or anti-symmetric part of H lambda I squared. And so we're going to calculate the sine of Q as the product of all of minus one to the J I. And well, if uh, the sine of Q is plus one, the copy S new indexed by Q lands into the symmetric part of the square. And if the sine is negative, then well, the S new lands into the anti-symmetric part of the square. Now let's see this in an example first off. Um, if we look at the tableau that we have, so for the first sub tableau, it's rather simple. We don't need to do anything. We already have a straight tableau and it has shape seven three. So this lands into the anti-symmetric part of H5. As we had seen before, this is the same shape we had before. Now for um, the sub tableau, which has entries three and fours. Well, when we rectify it, we get this tableau, which has shape five one. It's exactly the same shape we had before. And the fact that the second part is, uh, is odd tells us, well, that we land into the anti-symmetric part of H3. And finally, we define, we have that the sine of Q, it's minus one to the three times minus one to the one, and this gives, gives us plus one. And so this tableau, the associated sure function S nu, which is uh, indexed by this tableau, well, it goes into the symmetric part of H53. So using our theor first theorem, well, we have that we're able to define really precisely uh, which sure functions will land into the symmetric or the anti-symmetric part by just looking at the cardinality of the set of tableaus of uh, um, semi-standard Young tableaus of shape new and filling lambda squared where the sign is either plus one or minus one. So hopefully you already have a bit of insight of why this is all true. Um, so the, the more uh, pre, uh, global description of the, uh, the proof, all the details are in our article. Uh, the main idea is we start off with a lambda square tuple of line tableaus. We have an associated bywords and pair of tableaus. Um, the byword we can split up in sub bywords where we take so all top letters being one and two or three and four or five and six, et cetera, with the word of the associated um, tableau, line tableau. We can insert this into a pair of, of um, tableaus of the same shape. Um, the first one, well, it was going to be the rectification of the product, star product of those two tableaus. The QI, that's maybe a bit less easy to see. Well, we have that it's the rectification of those sub tableaus of Q that um, we uh, have been using. Uh, this is actually only properties of RSK. Um, there's a nice proof of it in uh, the book of Bolton again. Um, and now for the reason why we can use this actually to define the product of H lambda square, where 
as I said before, we have this decomposition. Each h lambda i squared has this decomposition in terms of um, platisms. And then what we're doing is actually we're looking at, um, OK, I'm taking something in this one. And then maybe I'm taking something in this one. And I'm doing this for all, uh, for all the h lambda i. And then, well, we have this nice formula that tells us, well, if we look at the um, indices of for which h lambda i, we take the anti symmetric part. Well, if we take an even number of them, we land into the symmetric part. And if we take an odd number of them, we land into the anti symmetric part. And so this is proved using only basic facts about uh, platism and uh, symmetric sure functions. And uh, the, all the details are in our article if you're interested in to, uh, looking more uh, into that. And so if we uh, take the, uh, uh, our set i to be all the indices where uh, the g i is odd, so that the associated sure function in uh, h lambda i squared uh, lies into the anti-symmetric part. Well, if we take an even number of those, the, sure, the, symmet the sign of Q will be positive. And if we take an odd number of them, well, the sign will be negative. So the sign of Q uh, really does tell us if we land into the symmetric or anti-symmetric part. And so what we're inter interested in doing next, well, we, we would like to understand better what's happening with h lambda to the m. And so we've done h lambda squared. What, what about h lambda up to the 3, to the 4, et cetera? And so we have that um, for h lambda n, we have exactly the same decomposition, the same construction as we've done, as we've done that works very well. And we have that. Uh, h lambda to the n decomposes also as a sum of platisms, but possibly with certain multiplicity, which is the number of uh, standard Young tableaus of shape nu. And so maybe to give you an idea of the complexity of it uh, for a, a very small example. So um, for uh, n equals 3, we have this decomposition in terms of platism. And if we even just start with hm to the three, so just taking, uh, just adding only once each horizontal band of same length m, um, well, if we take m equals one, which is the very, very simplest case we can look at, um, this one is still a bit, it, it's still doable because I mean, we're getting exactly the same shapes as uh, what we have here in the platism. So we can see that these two would get uh, into two different copies of S21 of HM, well, H1. And uh, the last one, well, it would land into this one. But then, even if we only look at m equals two, um, it's already really not clear what's happening. Um, it's, it would make sense that this one lands in the first platism, but then it kind of seems like it would make sense that this one would land into this platism, but it actually lands into this one. Um, we have uh, that uh, Chan and Thrall gave uh, formulas for how many copies of S nu should land into each platism for S111 and S3. So kind of all of the extra sure functions would land into one of these copies. Um, and so we're able to use this most of the time uh, for very, very small Ms to define where we, we should land. Um, but we should be able to define a statistic directly on those tableaus we get here in order to decide into which platism each, uh, well, the associated sure function lands, um, but it's actually not easy to see. Um, and this is a very, very simple example, but 
as, as I mean, as soon as we move to a bit bigger example, even just for HM, uh, we have that more or less a sixth of the tableaus would land into S3, more or less a sixth of the tableaus will land into S111, and the other ones will land in S21. So we really want to define a statistic on those tableaus that will tell us um, exactly where we land. And if possible, even like in which of the two we're landing, because that would be a, a very, very interesting to understand. Um, so maybe a quick recap of, of what we've been uh, doing. Uh, so we looked at H lambda square. We described combinatorially those coefficients as Q tableaus obtained through RSK. And we defined the statistic which is the sign statistic, where uh, we start off with our tableau Q. We look at sub tableaus, which with entries one and two, entries two, three and four, entries five and six, et cetera. We rectify those skew tableaus into straight tableaus. Each will have at most two lines and the parity of the number of boxes in the second row tells us the, if we land into the symmetric part of our anti-symmetric part in H lambda one squared or H lambda two squared, et cetera. And uh, we can define the sign statistic this way. And if we have positive sign, we land into the symmetric part. And, uh, or if we have negative sign, we land into the anti-symmetric part. And so in the future, we'd like to be able to uh, continue this into, um, so for if we were able to any n, but even just for three would be uh, great. So uh, thank you. And um, so if you're you're you've been interested in our uh, in this presentation, please have a look at our article when it gets onto archive tomorrow. And uh, in the article, we actually uh, generalize our construction to uh, e lambda square. So um, thank you. Let's give Florence a round of applause. That was a great talk. Um, very nice. Okay, let's open it up to questions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was a really good talk and it flowed really well. So for the case where we don't have squares, do we, instead of the parity get like mod n? So when we don't have squares, what do you mean? When we have H lambda? Yeah, so in this case, uh, like we are doing for general N. So initially we were doing the parity of the second row. Instead of doing the parity of the second row, do we get like mod N if you're considering to the power N? Um, you mean if we would have to look at the Nth row? Um. Yeah, I actually don't know which row to look at, but like, yeah. in some sense, like we have a parity thing here and it's a square. And so if we do H lambda to the power N, are we, do we have like statistic that goes into modulo N? Um, that's exactly what we want to do. We're wanna, wanting to kind of understand what's happening. Um, yeah. So even for, for H, starting with H lambda and looking at uh, the different ones, we've been uh, working really hard to understand better what's happening. Um, one, one thing that we have uh, seen is that, well, if you look at um, columns, um, it actually gives you an idea of what you have to do. So for example, here I have a column, I have one, two, three. So this tableau would be going into this, copy of S21. So it's like when there's a column, you look at what's to the right and you kind of do the conjugate of the tableau and that's the, the, the platism that you have to associate to. So for example, if we look at this one, um, this is the shape. So it should be landing into the other one as in terms of platisms. Um, but if we don't have columns, for example, so all the <laughs> other ones, um, it's really, I mean, we can use the, the formula of uh, Chen and Troll uh, 
um, with uh, so which give us the the fact that there's actually none in uh, those those two so s11 and s3 so um, for example these two they were landing they would land each one in one of the copies of s21 um, but then you know we can wonder like okay does this one land into the same as this one because there's a two at the bottom or and this one would land into this one because there's a three but then what do we do with these you know where there's one two at the bottom and one three or two twos in the bottom you know so we're even for just this one it's and and for of course other ones uh, for m greater um it's really not that easy to to define like what would be the right statistic because we can't use a sign statistic because we have you know three things appearing here um so we 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 looked a lot about, uh, at this, but we haven't found a statistic that's uh, nice yet. Okay, that's interesting. Other questions? Uh, hi, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, have you tried to look at this problem uh, uh, working on the coplactic monoid? Uh, yes, actually, the, the coplactic monoids was kind of a motivation for us to be working uh, with this setting, especially with the product of tableaus. Um, and so, I mean, we can we we have used a lot of uh, things from the coplactic monoid to to do this, but uh, it's a good idea. We could have a look of, uh, more about what coplactic uh, monoid has to offer, of course. Um, and I see in the in the in the chat uh, there's a question about the paper by Karine Leclerc, and so if you're familiar with the paper by Karine Leclerc, it's like almost the same title as for us. Um, and this it, it's a really it was an inspiration, of course. Uh, most uh, part of it was because well. At start, we had an idea that maybe we could use this result, their result to uh, try and, and solve this problem. And um, well, in the case of HM, uh, we have a sure function so we can use this their result to retrieve ours. Um, in my opinion, it's easier to use our results uh, to, to figure out this problem. Um, but for HM, we can, uh, you can find the same uh, results using Yamanushi domino tableaus uh, for certain co-spin, and you will find back the same results as what we have uh, here. Um, and so it was a big uh, motivation, and so the, that's why we used the uh, uh, we used our their title as a motivation for ours. We have to put that yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Florence. Yes. Uh, this is more of a uh, this is the infamous more of a comment than a question. Uh, great talk, first of all. Uh, so I think when you, say, uh, you when you define the sign using the rectification, there is actually a way to compute it without doing the rectification. Uh, can you scroll up to the serum, the big one? Yes, of course. Uh, this one or uh, serum one. The first one. All right. The one where the sign is defined. Yeah. Yep. So uh, when you have a tableau with only two possible numbers, let's say one and two, and you want to know what the first row of its rectification is, well, it's the length of the longest increasing subsequence in the reading word, because yeah. this is invariant under the SK. And uh, so basically, you can count from the bottom uh, to the top. Uh, it's, it's, it's like O of N somewhere, O of N square, I believe. Uh, it's probably simpler than rectifying. So when when you're looking at only entries one and two, um, yes, or or three and four, I just call them one and two. So you're talking about oh. the fact that it's um, looking at the longest increasing sequence will be telling us how many uh, elements we'll have in the second row. Uh, no, in this case, the longest increasing subsequence is the first row because it's actually a straight tableau already. But yeah. in the next case, for example, you can start with the threes on the third row, then you jump to the three in the second row and the four, and then you pick the four from the first row. You have to go uh, always northeast. 
So your increasing sequence should be an increasing sequence of elements walking northeast. Well, the, the thing is that when we do the insertion, we're, we're inserting with a um, byword. So I'm not, you mean, what we can do is we can do the insertion of only this um, and then we get the, the shape that we want. We can, we could look at longest increasing sequence in this, um, in this sub word. Uh, probably, okay. Because yep. the, the insertion of only this uh, sub by word would give us, so the, the tableau we get by doing the star product of these two tableaus and the tableau, which is the rectification of uh, the, the entries three and four. So we could just do this uh, insertion alone. Yes. So we, we could uh, just do the insertion of every uh, pair. It's just that doing it uh, the other way, we can do, uh, we can start off with any just any tableau of a certain shape and certain filling without doing the insertion. The RSK insertion is just the motivation of why we can define the sign like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I'm just saying it's not necessary to rectify it, to, to compute it. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, I think if you do start with uh, in the other way, like uh, with a uh, any byword in this way, um, you could just do the, uh, you know, compute the longest increasing sequence of the bottom word for the, the two, the first two parts, and then the longest increasing sequence for the second two parts and etc. You could start off with the by bywords instead of uh, tableaus as well, if you'd like. Maybe that would give us a, a quicker algorithm. Frankly, I thought it's longest okay. increasing sequence is the top row parts, because you're saying you're you're rectifying QI, right? Or are you rectifying the 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 number the numbers in the tableau? You're rectifying are say two i minus one and two i, right? Well, there's the it's based on a result of uh, that appears in Fulton's book that uh, when you insert this uh, sub this sub word. Uh, sub byword into uh, an, a tableau that's already filled. So with the previously inserted entries, um, you get a skew tableau. And if you rectify it, you get uh, this tableau, which you would have, this in recording tableau you would have gotten by just inserting this, this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, it looks like we're at the hour or a little past it. So um, yeah, I'm happy to keep the room open and stick around if people have more questions, but let's give uh, Florence another round of applause for her awesome talk. Okay, so feel free to go. And if you have uh, questions, feel free to stay.